Mitt's narrow win in Iowa and man-made earthquakes in Youngstown. From the Vitell studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Joe Hallett, Senior Editor for the Columbus Dispatch. Julie Karras-Smythe, State House Correspondent for the Associated Press. Terry Casey, Republican Strategist. And Sam Gresham, Common Cause, Ohio. Finally, voters are having an actual say in the presidential race. After about a year-long pregame show, the caucus and primary contests are underway. First up was Iowa, and the results lived up to the hype. Mitt Romney, who six months ago was writing off Iowa as unwinnable, he won it, barely. The former Massachusetts governor received 25 percent of the vote. Coming in second by just eight votes was Rick Santorum. The social issues conservative timed his rise to the top perfectly. Unlike Michelle Bachman, Rick Perry, Herman Cain, and Newt Gingrich, his support crest came Tuesday night. The message I shared with you tonight is not an Iowa message or an Iowa and South Carolina message. It is a message that will resonate across this land. Joe Hallett, you were in Iowa last week, earlier this week. Will Rick Santorum's message resonate here in Ohio? Good question. Uh, there's a lot to like for Ohioans in Santorum. One, that he's a, a blue-collar guy from Pennsylvania. He can relate to Ohio issues. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic, which always plays pretty well in Ohio, particularly in the northern Ohio area. He has a chance, I think, to appeal to the same kind of independent voters who at once went to for Barack Obama and then went for John Kasich. Um, the problem is he's about to get nuked. Uh, the other candidates in this race, namely Mitt Romney and the uh, Democrats, are going to expose his record. And he is a cultural warrior. He's taken some pretty extreme positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be uh, surprised if he lasts much longer. Mm. And uh, if Quinnipiac did a poll in Ohio in December, which is, you know, a uh, eons ago by political terms, but um, it, he had 2% of the vote. He was well down in the, in the poll, and uh, of course now he will bring forth his, his full game and his ads and all that, and we'll see what happens then. But he does have some challenges. I mean, by the time it gets to Ohio, which is March 6th, so-called Super Tuesday, he won't win in Virginia because he's not on the ballot in Virginia, which is a problem mm -hmm. that he put all, he front-loaded everything into Iowa. And one trivia question, Joe probably knows the correct answer. How many delegates to the convention did Santorum or Romney get out of Iowa? And the answer is zero because basically Iowa was a beauty contest. Mm -hmm. No delegates were decided. So really New Hampshire starts the real stuff. Uh, and you're going to have Florida, South Carolina, others that will be in there before we get to Ohio. Joe, is he really raw meat for the Republicans in Ohio? I mean, some of the positions this man has taken with regards to saying that uh, contraceptives should be banned and that uh, pro-choice people are close to being involved with slavery. I can go on and on. Is he really raw meat? People in Ohio are really going to support that? Well, what the... What Iowa did was try to define, it winnowed the field as it usually does, and it tried to define in this case the on Romney. I mean, Romney's been the national favorite all along. Uh, he's going to win New Hampshire on Tuesday. The Waterloo for the on Romney candidates, namely Santorum and Gingrich and Rick Perry, is South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they're going to get uh, put a dent in Romney's momentum, it's going to have to be there. But there was a new poll out today by by uh, Time CNN, and it shows that Romney has 37 percent, uh, Santorum 19 percent, Newt uh, 18 percent, and Perry 5 in is South Carolina. Is this national or just New Hampshire? New Hampshire? South no, Carolina. this is South, South Carolina. Carolina. South Carolina, okay. Uh, Romney already has a hefty lead in South Carolina, so if they don't stop him there, it's over. And South Carolina, he's got the support of the Tea Party backed and Sarah Palin backed governor there. Uh, now, the other factor, it's going to take a little longer to get this decided because the Republicans have changed their rules in a lot of the states, including Ohio. There's a lot more proportional representation. So it's going to be harder to lock it up early compared to the way it was in the past. But still, I agree with Joe. If Romney can win both New Hampshire and South Carolina, it makes it a lot easier for him to be the one. Yeah, primaries held before 
April 1st, it's ba your delegate count is based on your percentage of the vote. So Ohio has 66 delegates, March 6th, have to be doled out proportionally. I mean, really, a, a candidate here is only going to get 30, maybe 40 delegates. Well, and also in Ohio, part of the delegates are elected in each of the 16 congressional mm -hmm. districts, three delegates each. So mm -hmm. that kind of helps uh, spread it out. But we've got a long ways to go, and clearly the other candidates, including Santorum, they just don't have the organizational, the grassroots kind of uh, support that uh, I, I Obama and some others have. I think that would be an advantage for Obama. The sooner the, the decks are cleared, the uh, the easier we can begin to see the difference in the candidates. I don't know if we're going to have that by South Carolina. I believe maybe Florida. I'm not sure. I would disagree, Sam. I think Obama wants this to go on as long as possible to let these people keep ripping into each other, particularly Romney, and, and weakening them. Uh, How Republican, Republican dollars pay for ripping into Romney? Yeah, yeah but they're getting dollars. too much TV but that, time. But, but Sam, that was what had the four years ago that... that the Republicans were going to take advantage of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama going after each other in the work. 2 o'clock in the morning phone call, mm -mm. but still Obama prevailed. Right, right. And I mean, Sam, you can wish all you want the Republicans will be divided. The ultimate organizing and unifying thing for Republicans is Obama, is Obama, Obama Obamacare, and this sad economy. I, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with but that. But will religious conservatives really rally behind Mitt Romney yeah. like they rally behind George W. Bush? Well, some of them are kind of torn because they want somebody as conservative as they can get, but they also want to win. And one of the differences. Iowa is driven a lot more by the fundamental Christian group than, say, a New Hampshire or, say, a state like Ohio. They're significant in Ohio, but they're not as significant. I as don't think religion trumps politics. I'm from Mississippi. I just don't believe that. I think in the waiting hours of this thing, him being a Mormon on the evangelicals and some of the strong right wing Christians is going to affect him. I don't think the enthusiasm. I'm from Mississippi. I don't believe that. The, the one sentiment I heard over and over again from Iowa Republicans was, we have our favorite candidate, but if our favorite candidate is not the nominee, we'll support whoever it is because we want Obama out of office so badly. Right. See, Sam, I just want to give Obama full credit to being a great organizer and unifier of the Republican Party. One name we haven't mentioned here is Ron Paul. Julie, does he stay throughout? I don't know. I think he's emerging as uh, as people start to pay attention and as you say the real votes are cast that you know some of his his more uh, unconventional um, sort of policies and thoughts I, d I don't see it I really don't third party a lot of a lot of uh, I went to these events and the Paul events in Iowa they were almost like cult like events I mean the <laughs> true believers in him he, he's a you know there's a lot of people across this political spectrum who like his libertarianism but uh, once they learn more about his stance, including legalizing heroin, uh, including basically withdrawing from the world, both right. economically and militarily, mm -hmm. uh, he's not going to sell with Republicans. And, Although and he, if he's going to go anywhere, it would be as a third party candidate. Yeah, and as uh, I did notice too, covering some of the Tea Party activity in the last couple of years here, that when you go to those rallies, you have a lot of Ron Paul supporters. And that group may be unsatisfied, as we're talking about with Romney, and they may come out. I strongly believe that in the end. I don't care what anybody says to me. Uh, they dislike Obama, but I don't believe. Politics trumps religion. I just don't believe it. Speaking of President Obama, he is running against the Republican Congress as much as he's running against GOP candidates for president. He brought both campaigns to Ohio this week and used the stop in Shaker Heights to announce the recess appointment of Richard Cordray as the nation's chief consumer financial watchdog. His job will be to protect families like yours from the abuses of the financial industry. His job will be to make sure that you've got all the information you need to make important financial decisions. The appointment may not stick. Republicans in the Senate say they are not actually in recess because they are holding occasional non-business session, and they say that Cordray's new agency has too much power. Terry Casey, by opposing this appointment, aren't the Republicans playing into the president's hand, his populist stance that he's trying to guard against Wall Street abuses for the consumer? Well, it sounds good, but the problem is they're going to play the tapes from 06, 
excuse me, 07 and 08, when Obama and Harry Reid stood in the Senate and said no to George Bush trying to make the similar kind of thing. And the fact of the matter is, Tuesday, the Senate was in session, so it wasn't like they disappeared. They I mean, were in session for how long? Well, it doesn't matter how long. Well, it was it, generally a couple minutes, well, right? Bang it cl- open, bang it closed. You're well, but this session. is not like the 1800s yeah. when the Senate or Congress might disappear for months and months and months from the Capitol. The reality is this is going to be challenged legally, and the problem is every decision that Cordray would make, every decision that the National Labor Relations Board would make will be challenged in court, and there's this little detail called Article 2, Section 2 of this thing called the U.S. Constitution that Obama swore to uphold, and it says that the Senate does have the right and the responsibility of advice and consent. This is what people don't like. All these little tricks, all these little games that we constantly play, and and the people are dying. People want that uh, agency to enforce the bill. Look how we got our, our economy. We almost went off the edge of the cliff. We need these people. I, 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 the people I hear from, they get so frustrated and they're tired of the trickery, as they call it. Well, but this is the well, same thing that Harry Reid and Obama did in 07. But the, the bottom line here is that the agency was created by the Congress. Things change, politics change, and now we don't have a head of this agency. And I think that they're fighting against themselves in terms of the legitimacy of their institution. I mean, if, if they're going to pass bills when one party's in charge and then the minute the next one's in okay. charge, we're going to switch. I mean, this is just sort of part of this divisiveness we've been talking about this, this year. This was the wrong fight for Rep- Republicans to pick. Uh, first of all, they're they're bucking an agency that most Americans really mm-hmm. believe is needed and needs to have a lot of t- teeth. And secondly, they're opposing a guy who is basically unopposable. I mean, how can you <laughs> not like Richard Cordray? Cordray? He's got an excellent record. He's not a flamethrower. He's not somebody who's a, who's a, a threat. He's just got a long record of being a nose to the ground, good public servant. That's true. And, uh, bipartisan. Uh, bipartisan. He's got, it, last time he ran, well, in 06, he got endorsements from I think, Republicans. Well, you know, people but, like, but the last uh, time he ran in 2010, the voters said no, and he lost once before well, for Ohio. They said no to every other Democrat. Democrat. Yeah. Well, yeah. but I mean, elections have consequences, and the American people, not just in Ohio, but across the nation, said, we don't want Congress of Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid doing the same things they were doing. We need to change. That was a Gresham quote you had, mm-hmm. election had. That now, it's no coincidence that the president... <laughs> made this announcement in Ohio with one of Ohio's favorite sons, even if he may not be everyone's favorite son, and in Cleveland, which has been hit hard by the predatory lending. Mm -hmm. This message really goes through there. Does he even care, Joe, if Richard Cordray is able to implement or he gets challenged in court? Well, I wouldn't say he doesn't care, Uh but, you know, his, right now, the president's motivation is Mm re-election, and uh, he needs to be re-elected by winning Ohio. And so it was, it was smart politics to come here to do this with kind of an in-your-face to Republicans, including our own Senator Rob Portman, who could be on the Republican ticket this year. Uh, Portman, I think, uh, and the other Republicans, as I said, are on the wrong, wrong side of this battle, politically anyway. Getting to this recess appointment and the legality of this and how it could be challenged in court, now that he's in this position, what he's going to do is he's going to actually make the regulations. He's going to put them down on right. paper. Won't it be harder to do away with these regulations once they're in place? People see them. They perhaps work. They bust a bank that's up to no good. It's not quite... I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I, I guess that's why uh, Obama thought it was important for his own political purposes, as Joe said. It, once you start seeing the results of it, like most of the legislation, health care, we haven't seen the visible results. Uh, of this agency, we haven't seen the visible results. Well, whatever happens, it was good for Cordray. Because he's the next gubernatorial candidate on a Democratic ticket in this state. So whether he stays there or not, I would be willing to bet you that propelled him onto the political scene again, and it was good for him regardless. Well, and he, uh, Cordray represented a compromise candidate, if we remember, mm-hmm. for Obama, that he wanted Elizabeth Warren. Warren. She was yeah. too controversial. He came back with a guy who he thought <clears throat> had had bo- support from both uh parties. And so I think he looked at it as, you know, he can use that to his advantage to talk about the divided 
Congress. But historically, some presidents, like Bill Clinton, when he then faced the Congress of the opposite party, you can fight at him, you can throw stones at him, or you can choose to work with him and try and persuade him. And I would argue that President Obama has taken a more confrontational stage oh, instead of trying to work and get some things done. Oh, God, no. How did you come to that conclusion? Au contraire. Well, this has most been the, the most giving in Democratic president I've ever seen. Really? And you call him confrontational. Give away Willie. You call him confrontational. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying Clinton learned to work with Republicans and get things done. And yeah, Clinton he had different Republicans budget. to work with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, John Kasich was there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. They got balanced budget for three he straight gave years. He everything well, in the beginning. He doesn't do that anymore. All right. <laughs> Enough politics. Let's get to the earth shaking. The earth has been shaking frequently near Youngstown over the past nine months. Seismologists suspect the quakes were triggered by deep disposal wells. The wells dispose of water and hazardous chemicals left over after hydraulic fracturing or fracking for natural gas. Environmentalists say this is proof. The method of disposing fracking fluid is unsafe. Seismologists and the industry say this is probably just a rare occurrence. Tell you, Julie, Youngstown can't win. They finally find an industry they can work, they can right. use, and they, they, they get start to get earthquakes. But right. to be clear, this it's not the fracking drilling that's causing the earthquakes. It's the disposal of the fracking fluid. Right, correct. This is a well. It's a deep injection well. And what they do is they drill down. Um, I'm going to forget the, the numbers, but uh, super, super far, yeah. <laughs> and they put uh, water back in there that was used in not only actually in fracking, but in lots of different well uh, mm -hmm. drilling and that kind of thing. So what happened in this one case, uh, and, and we are still working to see whether this is one for one identified with what's been going on, but seismologists do think that this was probably set on a fault and or near a fault, and they point to 166 other wells just like this that have been in operating in Ohio for since the 80s with no problems. They probably need to move this one, which is, like you say, it's not good for Youngstown. Um, but it also is being pointed to by environmentalists. Hey, you know, this is a big ticket thing. When you start earthquakes with this stuff, it's one thing to be talking about people's sight lines in their backyard. It's another thing to be talking about shaking mm -hmm. the Mahoning Valley on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. Does this scrap fracking or just make people slow it down to study it more? To I, I think it continues the problem that we have. It's a report Common Cause issued called uh, Deep Drilling and Deep Pockets in Congress that we issued. Some $747 million over the last 10 years have been given to elected officials. There are controversies. There are problems with this approach. There will be uh, consequences and things like hitting the fault line. But aren't there problems with anything? I mean, windmills kill birds. I mean, there, there are consequences with any yeah, major but the, effort. But the long-term effects to the environment that this thing can cause and where they put the chemicals and where they, they hide it, I think it's a, it's a, I'm not against, but I want to have a thorough discussion to understand and I'm against until I can get assurances that I won't have repercussions from it. Well, but, here's but, one thing is that as I talked to a couple uh, hydrogeologists this week who said it is completely well-documented, well-known, historically uh, proven that this type of drilling will cause earthquakes if it's too near fault. They're not that worried about it. They just say you have to move the well. Um, so, you know, it's, um, they need to dispose of the water. They're disposing of it in a safe layer, uh, according to the uh, hydrologist I talked to from Battelle, who said that basically um, it goes into sort of a sandstone-like uh, area where there are already chemicals, there's already mm. been sometimes natural gas and oil. Radiation down there as well. And radiation. Yeah. But Sam, I think we ought to look at science on this. And the governor correctly said, let's halt, let's find out what's going on. They've got somebody from Columbia University, apparently pretty respected in this. But we shouldn't, I mean, just because we have one plane crash or one car crash doesn't mean you stop all automobiles and all airplane flights. So, But it was the, 11. It was 11 earthquakes. Right, but if, but if it's in the fault line, <laughs> make sure you don't drill in the fault line. But where do you know what a fault line's at? Well, scientists can figure those kind of things out, <laughs> Sam. And Sam, by the way, we want to make sure people in Ohio can keep their homes warm during the winter and that people have jobs because yeah. that's important too. I don't too. want them to blow but, up, Casey. I don't want them to just implode. 
But it is interesting that uh, at least one person I talked to who was the state geologist said, no, you can't always know where a fault line is until you drill into it. Right. So as we escalate our drilling of both the well, the oil and gas wells, and then the waste disposal wells, uh, we could hit these situations more and more. So I think that's part of what the Kasich administration is trying to figure out. It's just a tough issue because this is like a 21st century gold rush for Ohio and these other states. Uh, that have the shale and uh, the the opportunity for jobs and and economic uh, benefit from this is enormous, and yet as Julie Julie's excellent story uh, pointed out, there's so far scant research on what all this means and and what the ram ramifications are for this, and so I think we're wise, and I think Governor Casey acted appropriately. Just to be careful, go slowly on this. And that's been his theme throughout this whole fracking debate. Our last topic, Columbus City Council this week took up the issue of what one city official calls a vacancy epidemic. City Attorney Rick Pfeiffer says there are up to 900 vacant houses in Columbus. That's a 30% increase than just the last five years. The houses are eyesores, magnets for crime, and dangerous, as demonstrated by a fatal fire Christmas Eve in Franklinton. Sam Gresham, 900 houses. It would take the city of Columbus $11 million to tear them all down. Is that the solution? I think something has to be done, and it's a clear example of the hangover of the financial crisis that we have uh, just experienced. But I also think it's the residue of the destruction of families uh, because they have to abandon their houses. They have to leave an environment. They have to create problems for other people in our community? I think it's an important question. Now, whether we have the resources to do it and what will happen to these communities over the long term, no, we do not have the resources to do it. What will happen to these communities over the long term is that the abandonment will affect the prices of the homes of the existing people. It will invite in people who will continue to uh, cause that community to, to deteriorate. It's not a simple answer to this problem. I'm going to kind of agree with Sam. It is a big problem, and CBS's 60 Minutes did a big piece in December on this, and some of the points made that, sadly, some of these neighborhoods, and again, Cleveland's got a lot worse than it's we like do. It's ten times as bad up there. Things are so bad there, it's almost impossible to rehab it, but I'd also encourage the mayor and others to start looking at crime and school problems because one of the things that makes it tough for people to come in rehab the houses if they feel things are too negative in some of the neighborhoods as far as school quality or crime. So it's a complicated problem. There was a lot of greed in the housing thing that caused this, uh, but I think Columbus has got more time to fix it than, say, Cleveland does. Do you see a time where like, Youngstown has, has shrunk the city a bit? Detroit has mm. basically abandoned some neighborhoods. They're not going to service some neighborhoods. Do we ever see a point where, if it doesn't get corrected, that some parts of this city, a neighborhood in the south side, a block on the east side or on the near west side, they just turn it into a park or a green well, space. all communities have cycles that they go through, the upside and the downside. Um, the question is, in our economy and the connotations of these communities, whether it's income-wise or racial-wise, will make that rejuvenation much more dif difficult. And what typically happens is the low-income people or the people of color have to be displaced before the rejuvenation takes place. Now, in our community, we're going to have an experiment. It's called Poindexter Village on the east side. It's associated with the East OSU East. 23 acres will be available in the city of Columbus, and it will be all virgin land. Now, what happens to the neighborhood around that when that 23 acres is available, and does it spur uh, residential development, or does it sit there dormant for years? And sometimes the um, interest in preserving um, communities in the in the inner city and in you know that kind of thing can be a good thing uh, for us here in the Northeast. I know I lived in Florida at one time, and their ghettos and if you want to call them that, abandoned or lower property were all on in the suburbs. They built them so quickly, and we're seeing some of that here in Ohio. But they built stuff so quickly that then the property value tanked, and you would see abandoned neighborhoods all around, ringing all the cities on the outer belts. Okay. Let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. Sam Gresham, you're up first. 
This housing problem is, uh, represents the entire nation, and there has to be a national solution that's spearheaded from state government and federal government, or we're never going to solve that problem. And I'm calling for people to begin to tackle that problem. Okay, Terry. Uh, I'm going to go away from politics to football. Uh, we thought the Trestle era was over, but sadly in the Gator Bowl game, we noticed the special teams, coached by his brother Dick Trestle, had a few problems, gave up two touchdowns that they shouldn't have. And my prediction is, sadly, uh, even though Jim Trestle had a good reputation, the result, reality, however, is that he got caught lying and fibbing, uh, and people are not going to remember the Trestle era very well. Julie. Uh, next week in the legislature, we're going to be busy again. I think we'll see um, the heartbeat bill um, folks try to push that thing through the Senate, and I think they're resistant on that side. And Joe. Sam will get his wish for the general election campaign to hurry up because uh, Romney will win New Hampshire and then win South Carolina, and it will be over long before it gets to Ohio in early March. So that's, that would be too bad because I'm wondering if Rick Santorum will keep wearing the sweater vest <laughs> if he's campaigning in Ohio because <laughs> the sweater vest doesn't have the same... Kind of Love that it had at one point. Way to loop that all back together. <laughs> that is Columbus on the record for this week. You can connect to our program online. You can watch old episodes. You can check out our blog. We have video of those Youngstown quakes. It's pretty funny. Done by kids. Uh, there were reenactments. Uh, all of that's at our website, WOSU.org slash COTR. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Look for us there. For our crew, for our panel here at WOSU at COSI, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.